My name is Ali Javed. I'm a medical doctor and a neuroscientist. But today I'll be talking about a story. I'll be starting with a story which is actually not very scientific. Has any one of you read this book? Not yet. So Many Lives, Many Masters is a masterpiece uh, written by Dr. Brian Wise, an American psychiatrist. And in this book, he describes a very interesting clinical anecdote. So he describes the story of a patient he encountered. Um, her name was Catherine back in the 80s. And Catherine suffered from inconsolable anxiety. Um, so she would get panic attacks and nothing would work. You know, they, they tried medicines, they didn't work. They tried psychotherapy, that didn't work. And actually then at some point, Dr. Wise, he resorted to more unorthodox approaches. And he ended up, you know, using hypnotherapy, hypnosis on Catherine. And it turned out that during these hypnotherapy sessions, Catherine would travel back to her past lives. And it turned out that there were a lot of traumas in her past life. So I just want to mention that in, in, in the real life, Catherine suffered from fear of drowning. She felt that she was being choked. She was being strangulated, although she had none of those experiences. But it turned out that in her past lives, she had experienced all of that. And then Brian Weiss, he sort of like resorted to this very innovative approach in which he started resolving Catherine's traumas during those past life sessions, you know. And as he resolved her traumas in Catherine's past lives, she started improving in her real life. And based on that, Dr. Weiss concluded that we are not sent from each plane with equal powers. Some of us possess powers greater than others because they have been accrued from other times. So in principle, I agree with Dr. Weiss, but I also think that there's a slight mistake in his title. I don't think it's many lives, many masters. It's actually many lives and one master. So you heard the story of Catherine. Let me tell you another story, a story perhaps which is a lot more universal and a story we all can relate to. The story of Sharbat Gula, AKA the Afghan girl. So Sharbat Gula was one of the many children who were affected by the Soviet war uh, back in the 80s. She was living in a refugee camp. She was spotted by an American photojournalist, Steve McCurry who took this photograph of Sherbet Gula, some people say even without her permission. Um, but nevertheless, what happened was that this photo became very famous. Steve McCurry gained worldwide recognition. The photo was published on the cover of National Geographic. And while Steve McCurry gained worldwide recognition, Sherbet Gula disappeared from the face of the earth. She was rediscovered several years later, actually around, I would say, 2025 20, years later. Um, and actually, she was rediscovered because she had forged her documents and was living illegally in Pakistan. So she was apprehended by the authorities, repatriated back to Afghanistan. But by that time, Sherbet Gula had a little child of her own. Um, and what me and my colleagues have been trying to study for the last 10 years or so is if the traumas and how the traumas which children like Sharbat Gula encounter early in their lives, how do they transmit, how do they pass on to their own children? So how does trauma travel across generations? And actually when we think about trauma, you know, we always think about humans, but actually trauma is something which is very well conserved across animal species. And we have learned a lot about intergenerational trauma by scientific studies on mice, several of which I have been myself involved in. So this is a mouse model of trauma, childhood trauma, which is very similar to human conditions. So what you see over here is unpredictable maternal separation and unpredictable maternal stress. So this model involves separation of pups from their mothers. 
early in life, in the first two weeks of life. And during that time, the mother is exposed to different stresses. So this is something that is very similar to human conditions in which a lot of times children have to suffer from parental separation or they suffer from neglect because parents are not able to take care of them because they are super stressed themselves. Now, these pups, when they grow to be adults, they develop a multitude of symptoms ranging from you know, brain pathologies like depression, um, like, you know, attention deficit. They show very, like, you know, a lot of risk-taking behaviors. So they kind of have a personality which is very similar to borderline personality disorder in humans. And at the same time, they also have defects in metabolism and defects in their immune functions. Uh, but perhaps the most fascinating part scientifically and at the same time most concerning part you know, as a humanitarian, is that a lot of these traumatic experiences, they are actually preserved in the next generation as well. They get transmitted to the next generation. So what you see over here is the mouse affected by childhood trauma, mated with an unaffected mouse, but the resulting offspring, the resulting little child mouse, actually has all the same symptoms which the affected mouse had. Now, this mouse was never affected by trauma. This mouse is just an offspring of a trauma-affected parent, but recapitulates all the different symptoms of trauma. So the question was, how does this transmission take place? So think about this. We are all made from one cell. Like, you know, our life starts with one cell, what we call zygote, which is actually developed, you know, it, it's, it's formed by the fertilization of germ cells, a sperm and an egg. So we questioned if the germ cells are actually responsible for transmission of this trauma across generations. So what we did was that we took the epigenetic material, RNA, I mean, a lot of you would remember it from high school biology. We take that and we inject it into zygote formed from unaffected mice. So RNA from the germ cell of a traumatized mouse injected into the zygote made from unaffected mice. And the resulting offspring carries all the different symptoms related to trauma. So it means that the trauma transmission occurs through the germline. Now, trauma is a very emotional experience. It is a cognitive experience. We perceive it in the brain. So the question was, how does trauma, which is initially perceived in the brain, affects the germ cells? So for that, we actually very intuitively thought about that this transmission probably takes place through blood, right? Because that's the connection between the brain and the germ cells. So we took the blood out of traumatized mice, injected it into unaffected mice, and it turned out that this generational phenotype, we call it scientifically, uh, in lay terms I would just call them symptoms, these symptoms of, of trauma were passed down the generation after the blood transfusion of the, you know, what I would call traumatized blood. So that makes it clear that trauma, initially perceived in the brain, affects, you know, some factors in the blood which carry them to the germ cells and eventually passed on to the next generation. But the situation is a lot more complex in humans. So there's multiple ways through which Sherbat Gula could have passed on her traumas to her child. One is, of course, like the germline transmission, which we talked about. But it's also possible that um, just experiencing multiple traumas made Sherbat Gula a mother who was not very nurturing. So because her parenting styles were not very nurturing, this child experienced a lot of trauma himself, just by, as a byproduct of that. Or it could be that while Sherbat Gula was breastfeeding this little boy early in his life, there was transmission through the milk. So this is why we started like a multiple cohort studies in which we are studying trauma across different countries around the globe, which are ethnically very, very different from each other. So what you see over here is a very interesting world map because it is the world map of consanguinity. So the reason we are looking at it is because when we study lab mice, they're all similar to each other genetically. You know, they are inbred, so they are like, you could say that they are married in a way to their cousins. 
But on the other hand, when we think about humans, there is consanguinity in some parts of the world, but not in other parts of the world. So we started trauma in, in cohorts with variable level of consanguinity. Starting from Pakistan, which has the highest consanguinity in the world, we started children, um, unfortunately, who lost their fathers within the preceding year. The mothers were alive, but were financially not viable. So they had to give up their children for adoption by the SOS Children's Village, which is a, a global orphanage. As well as we had another cohort of adult men who had experienced trauma during their childhood, either simple trauma or complex trauma. Another cohort actually comprised um, of survivors of Srebrenica. So Srebrenica genocide um, is one of the most unfortunate events in human history in which 8,000 individuals roughly were butchered in a single night. Um, mostly it were adult men who were killed in front of their children. The children were spared. A lot of these children themselves have children now. So we are studying the survivors of Srebrenica and their families, their children, to see if they have passed on any traumas to their offspring. Finally, we have another cohort um, of dyads, so it includes mothers and children, and the children have been breastfed by the mother. So here we are studying if there is any trauma transmission possible through milk. And again, you can see that there are different levels of consanguinity from like a population when there is high, very high consanguinity to moderate level of consanguinity, and actually Europe where there is no consanguinity at all. Now, Again, fascinating from a scientific point of view, despite the diversity of cohorts. So we have you know, children from Pakistan, we have mothers from Poland, we have like adult men from Pakistan and Bosnia. Despite this diversity, and despite looking at different body fluids ranging from blood to milk to sperm and seminal fluid, what we found out was that the markers of trauma, the signatures of trauma are unanimous. And we found out changes in this one particular microRNA. You can just say it is a regulator of gene expression across these different cohorts, across different ethnicities, across different body fluids. And this microRNA is very closely related to cholesterol. It is carried by fats, cholesterol, in the circulation. And it is actually regulating the production of cholesterol and can be affected something as simple as junk food. Now what that means is that this carrier of trauma in the blood is potentially cholesterol. Is this finding surprising? Well actually if you think about evolution, not so much. Because nature wants us to learn and nature wants us to reproduce. And that is why the only organs in your body which are protected by barriers is the brain and the germ cells. And the only molecule which can freely and easily cross these barriers, just transverse across these barriers, are actually fats. So it is not surprising that nature chose fats as this means of communication between different organs in the body, and even to propagate the signals of trauma across adulthood and even down to the subsequent generations. So if we think, and if this is like, you know, validated also independently by other studies, that fats are responsible for long-term propagation of trauma, as well as its transmission to the next generation, that means that there, the implications of that are huge for our lifestyle, also for the clinic. What that means is that junk food can potentially accentuate, can potentially enhance the negative effects of this trauma, including its transmission across generations. It also means that perhaps a healthy lifestyle, exercise, things which reduce the fats in your blood can potentially reduce some of this transmission. It also means that we perhaps need to think about some preconception screening. So when someone decides to, you know, to parent and, 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 and to conceive uh, a child, Perhaps we need to think about what kind of screenings we need to do before people start thinking about that, especially the ones which have been exposed to trauma, traumatic experiences in their childhood. And finally, we need to change the way clinical practice works. 
So when you go to a doctor, the doctor always asks you about family history, right? They ask you if your parents had diabetes, if your parents had high blood pressure. I think it's time they also start asking about history of exposures, especially traumatic exposures. Because if there's increased risk of psychiatric and metabolic disorders in children of individuals exposed to trauma, then I think by doing that screening, we can perhaps identify these symptoms early and start treatments early. And the implications don't end with the clinic, actually. We don't have to look far, far away to actually realize the implications of this field of work. Think about the children in Ukraine, the ones who were forced to immigrate, and the ones who were left behind, and the traumas they are suffering, and whether we are doing enough to also help them out in terms of their mental health. Perhaps this is also a point that the perpetrators of this war should be held accountable, not for only harming these children, but actually generations of humankind. But if you think about it, there are wars everywhere, right? And there is like um, an enormously alarming effect on children. They are the most vulnerable population everywhere. So does this mean that we have already doomed our future generations? Well, science has given also some hope to us. So I'll go back to the study on mice. So this is usually how mice are kept in a laboratory. They are placed in this cage, which is just like, you know, let's say a very empty environment. It's a cage, they are given food, but there is nothing else. Now, if we change the environment mice are living in to an enriched environment, where number one, they can socially communicate with each other, number two, they have access to physical exercise, you know, the kind of exercise mice can do. And finally, they have like, you know, these interesting games in which they're constantly learning new things. Then we see that this transmission of trauma as well as this long-term effects are at least partially rescued, which means environment enrichment can prevent at least partially this intergenerational transmission of trauma. There's some more hope coming from science as well. Because I talked about the generational effects of trauma. There's also evidence that uh, there are generational effects of parental smoking as well as parental exposure to high-fat diet. All the negative exposures. But at the same time, there is some evidence that there are also positive generational effects of positive exposures like exercise. So that if the parents are exercising, their next generation would have less risk of cardiovascular illnesses, metabolic disorders, and potentially also psychiatric illnesses. So science has also given us some hope. I'll go back to Brian Wise and Many Lives, Many Masters. I definitely do not believe in past lives, but I do think that the spiritual essence of the message which Brian Wise wanted to convey is not so different from what science conveys. And Dr. Wise, he concluded that we are not born with equal powers. I completely agree. But at the same time, what I want to say is that we all have the power to change. We all have the power to break the cycle of trauma. Now, science may have called it environmental enrichment, but if you really think about it, all what's needed is respecting our bodies by living a healthy life, spreading kindness, and nurturing a desire to learn new things. This is essentially what environment enrichment is. And if we do all that, perhaps we can save our next generations. So perhaps what will save the generations of humankind is not only a scientific revolution, but the one which is guided by a spiritual revolution. And when I talk about many lives, one master, just focus on it. Perhaps that master who can change the cycle of trauma, who can break the cycle of trauma, is actually you. That one master is you. Thank you very much.